What's up YouTube? In today's video, we're going to be looking at the Razor View Engine from the perspective of using it outside of a web application rather than inside of a web application, which is the typical use case. And so use it from outside of a web application. And in this particular case, use it for templating or basically creating HTML email templates so that you can have sort of smart or intelligent templates that produce HTML for you that you can then use to send out emails or HTML emails. So if this is of interest to you, you want to have a blast here. Now the assumption is that you do understand Razor. I'm not going to go into the details of how Razor works and all the features of Razor. Just be aware that all of the Razor features available to you, except you're not in a web application. So you're producing HTML, but in a console application or some other application, just not a web application. Now Razor, the view engine from the get go has always been, well not always, but almost always from the very start, has been independent of ASP.NET MVC. In fact, on my blog, and I'll show you this probably the, during the course of the video, I forget the year, it was so far back. <laughs> 2010, around that frame, time frame. So 10 years ago. <laughs> the I haven't checked to see, but I'm guessing that the article on my blog site is no longer valid. So today we're going to look at that. I'm going to show you C Sharp code that will be available for you to download from my GitHub. I'm going to show you two versions of the what I call the Razor template engine. This is the code that I've written on top of the existing Razor capability. And the idea is for you to tell me which version you prefer, version one, version two, and why. And I'll tell you why I made the changes from version one to version two. So maybe, you know, we can have that kind of a discussion. So I'll be curious to understand or hear from you your feedback on which version you prefer and why, or if you agree with me or not. All right. So without further ado, Let's get started. So before we get any deeper, I just want to show you the basic layout of the solution you're going to see downloaded from my GitHub. The console application is a simple console application that references the Razor template engine. All right, that's all it has. So there's nothing else here except for the Razor template engine. The second one is a unit testing project, which is again nothing special except it references the unit template, the <laughs> Razor template engine. So basically the meat of this whole thing is in this Razor template engine, right? This is a, it started off as a console application, regular, and this is in .NET Core. So it's like an assumption I make here in .NET Core 3.0, 3.1 onwards. So now with regards to this project, of course this will work as it is if you download the source code, but what if you're trying to start your own project? There are some changes that have occurred in the csproj file that you need to be aware of because this is, Without those changes, this stuff will not work, right? So I'm going to show you the CS proj file for the Razor template engine. And of course, for the first thing you'll notice is that normally we have Microsoft.web. Sorry, Microsoft.net.sdk.web or just SDK. In this particular case, we have the dot razor ending here. So this is a key. This is important for making this project. As I said, this project started off as a console application. And then you modify it, right? Or you could be starting off as a standard lab, standard .NET Core standard uh, library project and then modify it. So either way, this has been modified. The other things that have been modified here are these three, added on these three items under the property group. And this is essentially allowing you to, or allowing the project, to compile the Razor templates inside, into the exe or into the DLL. And this is a key concept to grasp as well. During development and debugging and everything else, you have an actual CS HTML file on your local machine in a specific path, and I'll show you all of that. When you compile the application, it's really not accessing that CS HTML file. It is, it is that CS HTML file has been compiled by the Razor engine into the assembly, or at least because of these settings that you're seeing here, that's what's happening. So that's also key, which means when you deploy this application, you don't actually need the CS HTML uh, template files to be deployed along with your assembly your application, all right? Hopefully that makes sense. So these three options here are enabling that. All right. Okay, I'm going to show you this application working. There's one more thing in this project file that I want to talk about, but it's important for you to first see the project working and then dig a little deeper into the solution. And then I can come back here and explain that part. All right. So let's look at what it is that we build. What is the outcome or output of this whole thing? 
and then look at the code that is used to produce that. All right, so in my project here, uh, the console application is the default project. I'm just going to comment out the. All right, first let's just see this thing work. All right, so the basic output of this Razor templating engine is the fact that we have now an HTML page that looks like that. There's an image in here. There's some data, some styling, some hyperlinks and stuff like that. So that's the output, meaning it's a full blown HTML page from the you know doc type tag or the HTML tag all the way down to the end cl closing HTML tag, all right? But there's a bit of a nuance here. So let's look at that. All right, zoom back into the project here. So this is the main project, the Razor template engine. In here, we have a templates folder. And then we got these two classes, both one v1 and v2. So these classes are essentially the same, but there's a version one and a version two we'll discuss later. Right now, I wanna show you the templates here. All right, we have one CSHTML file here, which is the Razor template. I'm gonna call that the Razor template, the CSHTML file. And then we have two HTML files. These are, let's call them, resource or embedded resource templates. These are, and I'll show you the details of what these are, okay? All right, so, and also notice the names. It says jobstart.cshtml, this one says jobstartfooter.html, and this one says jobstartheader.html, okay? Okay, let's look at the code now. So the cshtml file is nothing but a normal Razor cshtml. This Razor page has the, or is dependent on the job start model that's defined as its model job start it's got a bunch of local functions or methods here in this cshtml file and then there's a whole bunch of html that is describing the the page now notice here that it starts with header and it ends with some div here basically the idea is of the key thing to get across here i'm not sure if this is the limitation of razor or at least the way i've done it or what, but you can't have the body tag, the HTML body tag in this template, in the CSHTML file. So I, I don't know why that is, and I've spent a whole lot of time trying to figure this out. So what I've done is instead, you have an HTML file on the, like say the, the header part, if you will, that contains the body tag, and then another HTML file that contains the body tag, if you will. And this CSHTML file is in the middle of that. I hope that the visual aspect makes it clear. So because we can't have the body tag in the HTML, CSHTML file, we have an HTML file that has everything from the start up to a body tag in it, and then another HTML file that has the end from the body close tag on down to the end of the HTML page. Hopefully that makes sense. The names of these files do make a difference to the version two of the app, uh, the engine, all right? So the names, are the convention, if you will. So I'm following a certain convention the model is called job start, the CSHTML file is called job start. The header is called job start header.html and the footer is called job start footer.html. All right. And so that I assume here that you do understand razors. I'm not going to explain all the intricate details or nuances here and what these methods are and how they're being used from here, etc. But this is a normal full blown razor page, except for that body tag part. Everything else, all the razor features are available to you in this template. All right. Okay, then let's look at the HTML header. This is a normal HTML file. It's got the embedded styles in here and it goes all the way up to the body tag. Now keep in mind when you're doing emailing, there are a lot of other things you have to consider when you're sending out HTML emails, such as you've you got to embed the images in the email as an attachment and have an ID and associate that ID in the image tag and all that. That's not the ex point of this exercise or this video. I'm simply showing you the Razor templating engine. What you need to do to actually send a successful HTML email such that it's not blocked by Outlook and other uh, email readers and all that sort of thing. That's not part of this uh, video, but there is of course a, uh, there are lots of things you gotta be concerned about or careful about when you do send out those kinds of emails. But this is only going to help you produce the email, right? 
Okay, so the header has the style up to the body tag, and the footer will have whatever else, and also the including the closed body tag and the HTML. And in this case, it's got these links, all that. All right, so now let's look at the code. Now I'll show you the consuming side. Right? And this is important. When you design something, it's always good to understand what would it look like from the use case. Like how would I use this this thing, whatever I'm designing, right? How would, I, how would I use that? And it's important to design things from that perspective. So even though internally, as in within the class or the system, you're looking at things from a design perspective, how would one like, would one use it? All right, so we're gonna see the two different versions from a use case scenario, and then look at the version one of the image, the template engine, because there's just a subtle difference between version one and version two. All right, so I'm gonna move over to the uh, the console application that sort of uses, there's also the unit tests in this solution. We're not gonna be looking at those unit tests, but we're gonna just examine the console application. So if you went back here into the console application, let's look at the use case. So this is just data all the way up to here is essentially just initializing this job start DTO. This is the standard or normal POCO or a DTO. It's got a bunch of top level properties and then a collection of virtual machines and virtual machines look like that. All right, nothing special here. So we instantiate our data or our model and then we instantiate our Razor template engine here. And once we have an instance of the Razor template engine, we just call render template async and it sending it the model. Now the version two of the Razor template engine, it's API, if you will, it's public surface is saying, just give me the model, I'll figure the thing out. And that implies that based on the name of the model, the name, the type name, it's gonna go looking for a CSH HTML file by the same name, is going to go looking for an HTML file with the prefix of that name and then header.html and footer.html. Right? So it's by convention, if you will. The API is simpler then because you don't have to provide all that information. And there are assumptions being made as to where the, uh, the templates are going to be, what folder it's going to be in and stuff like that. So there's lots of those kinds of assumptions, but it's by convention. So it may be easier. That's version two. In version one, you have to specify all the templates. The benefit is if you want to mix and match templates, for example, let's say in your case, and there are many other ways to sort this out, but let's say in your case, you have the same HTML header file and the same HTML footer file across all your email templates, all your templates, then do you need to have the same thing copied over or could the system say, well, I'm going to use this header HTML and this footer HTML, just the body is going to change from model to model, model, right? So you can modify version two also to do that. Maybe you have the notion of a default header.html and a default footer.html. And if it can't find the template by the name of the model, it can go looking for that. So I won't go into the details of that. This, the source code is not intended to be some sort of a, you know, full blown library. It does exactly what I needed to do. So if you needed to do something different, you modified the sources there available to you, right? But that basic idea of the previous premise between version two and version one was in version two is more by convention, in version one you have to specify. So let's look at the signature for version one. So if you went into version one of the template here, this public method here, as you can see, is asking for the folder name, which is the template folder name, is asking for the template name, so that's the job start dot csHTML. It's asking for the header resource name, which is the the HTML, you know, job start header dot HTML and the job start footer dot HTML and the model. It's just asking for all this stuff from the folder name to the template names and so on and so forth. So of course this gives you more flexibility, but then also makes it a little more complicated for you to use it. And plus it sort of hints at, at least from a use case perspective inside the implementations of what's going on. So anyway, pick your choice. Do you prefer version one, version two? And there's a lot of other changes here. So ideally, if you looked at the code for version one and version two, you'll notice a lots of little changes, some code cleanup and various other things. You tell me why you prefer version one or version two by examining the code. All right, so that's the thing. Go to the my GitHub, download the code, check it out, make sure it works. 
and look at the differences and tell me which one you prefer. Of course, it's almost obvious that I prefer version 2. I wouldn't have made a version 2. Maybe the version 1 would have been better and that's it. So for me, my preference is version 2. But it just depends on, on what the use case and what scenarios are for you. And of course, preferences are based on you know, the compromises you're willing to or not willing to make. Right? So in my case, there are certain things I just feel strongly about. So for me, version 2 is just better. Now. It's not just about the ease of use. It's the code implementation and the other things there that I prefer. So, but you tell me. I'm hoping to have a lively discussion on this and uh, that you go look at the GitHub repo, download the code and check out the code. All right. Talking of these resource names, reminding me, I forgot to mention this other thing. These HTML, so as I mentioned in the beginning of the video, so talking about the HTML templates, you know, the head and the footer, I need to mention something here. So if you remember in the beginning, I said that everything is compiled into that executable in the DLL file, right? The HTML templates do as well. They take, get embedded as resource files. This is a normal Windows concept, and I'm guessing it's other operating systems as well. It's been there since eons, even before really I, you know, kind of grew up on Windows. There were resource files that were, that you could embed in, in your executable files or your assembly DLLs. And so what's happening is these HTML files are being embedded into the DLL assembly as resources. So they also get compiled and they're not compiled in that sense, but they're embedded. So the CS HTML file gets compiled and then embedded in the assembly and the HTML files get embedded as resource files in the assembly. How does that happen? So that's important to see here. So if you look at the CS proj file, once again, there's this additional item group here, where I say embed resource include any .html file, start .html file in the templates folder. And that's that. So it's happening automatically, but again, it's, I think it's happening automatically. So it's important for you to understand that when you drop that HTML file in that folder, it's going to automatically embed that as a resource. And then the there are classes in the Razor thing, the normal .NET classes that extract for you these embedded resources from the resource library, all right? So, and then the convention for resources is slightly different from the template. So for the Razor template, if you want to find that template or uh, build that, get the HTML for that template, the convention is slash templates, folder slash the name job start dot CS HTML. So it's start slash template uh, folder name slash CS HTML file name. For the resource, it's folder name dot resource name, right, with the dot HTML. So it's different to the way you get the access to the resource, embedded resources versus the way you get the access to the compile output of the, the CS HTML file. All right, certain subtleties just to highlight there. Now, this is version one of the, the template. The main process really is this render, this private method that says render async template, give it a template name, give it the model, and this is where the actual work starts. So I have put the compiled assemblies. You can look at the code in detail. I'm just going to give you this idea that the Razor compile items is like a dictionary that I've put all the possible templates that you have. And it's now in a dictionary by identified by the name. And so you can use the template name to determine if the assembly, if that compiled page is there. And if it is, provided the model and you'll get back the rendered output. The rendered output is interesting because we have a string writer and this will make sense as we progress along. We first get the razor page instance. And there's a lot of stuff to do there in order to get that. So let's go look at here. We first create the actual instance of the class and we start assigning certain properties to that class. Remember this compiled class, so it's now an instance of a class or not an object of a razor page. And we associate the view data model, view data and the model to the view data. And we also associate the text writer that we sent in over here and of course from here. Right, so this string writer that gets sent into this method here, we associate that string writer to the writer of the razor page dot view context. Right? This becomes important because 
the way Razor works is you would call on the Razor page, uh, execute async. That's it. So when you execute ES async in a normal MVC application internally, what would happen is it would write out the data to the writer in the HTML. We don't get a return thing back. It's just everything in ASP.NET is just using the same writer and the writer is passed along to the controls and the pages and everything else. So you're not having to concatenate strings all the time. You're simply writing out to the stream directly. So that gives you the performance. So you'll see that happening over here where we associate the text writer here and then code and all that. We return the page. So we've not actually used the text writer. But once we have the instance of the page, we call execute async, which effectively has written out the the HTML to the string writer. And then we can say to string and return that string. So when we call rendered output, we get the, the return value sent out. And we send that out here. So that's the return. And then therefore the render page gets an HTML string back as the rendered page. All right. So I'm, I'm not again trying to explain the class here. I think it's self-evident. This is very, very simple. I've kept it intentionally very, very simple. So, okay, now let's look at, does this actually work? What about actually using that HTML in an email, right? So let's go check that out. So what I'm going to do now is just modify the console application. It's already there. I'm just going to uncomment this out. So it's going to send an email to my personal account and we'll see the email arriving. So let's check that out. So when I run this application, we see the browser version as well, but then you'll see a notification for the email coming. All right, so there you see the notification, for the email. Let me just close this application out. Let's go check out the email. So that's the email. So here, as you can see, it's rendering perfectly fine in HTML or Norm. In this case, the images are not embedded that you know, like I was talking about earlier, so you're going to have to do that. This is not about how to correctly send HTML emails, but just to raise a template part. And then uh, the hyperlinks and everything is showing perfectly fine. I could probably show you some of this stuff here in case you're not familiar with Razor, but all of this can be is based on data. I'll take you through that process. Uh, let me also show you, that's my website, in case you don't know that. And in here, you should find... Razor, okay, Razor, Razor host. Hmm. Let me see. Yeah, so this is the article I was talking about, the Razor host engine. This was written in 2010, right? So that's 10 years ago. 10 years ago, this feature was enabled or available to us in .NET. And as I said, they probably changed it, but it's the same idea. You're able to use the functions, you're able to use HTML tags, and then produce the actual HTML. And I have, of course, you can look at this as well. This is the source code and everything is here for that as well. But I don't know if it's still working or they've made so many changes that it's no longer valid. So, but it's, this feature has been available since then. Okay, so now let's get back to our code here. All right. So I just want to show you some of the dynamic nature in case you're not very familiar with the razor, but you're still interested in the HTML part. This job start model has data. If we manipulate this data, the output can change. So let me just show you that in case you're not very comfortable with that aspect. So this, the fact that these are red and this is green and these are, this is orange and so on is based on values in the data law logic and the values in the data combined. So, now the email went out. Hmm. All right, so let's look at how this is happening here from a Razor standpoint. Maybe that'll be interesting for those of you who are not very familiar. And we should um, templates. All right, so we have a method called get CPU class name. It's going to get back to us a CSS class name style class name and that's conditional so you're still using the cpu value the percent utilized and if you look at the method here it says get cpu class name giving the cpu percent as we've got some logic here that says if the cpu utilization is greater than 50 then make it medium if it's greater than 85 make it high 
how do they make it low, right? So that's just simple. So based on the value of the CPU, 50 is kind of the threshold for medium, and then 85 is the threshold for high, meaning 50 and above, above 50, but below 85 is medium, and then so on. So if you look at the, I guess that turned it off. Let's go look at this again. <laughs> So let's say on the CPU side, this is 86 and that's 90. We know that there's a threshold for this to turn to red. If we got it down to, let's say, 80, this will turn orange, right? But if we simply change the data, we won't actually change the HTML. So let's look back at the logic. It says, okay, 15 above, but below 85. So let's make it 84. So if I made this 84 and ran this, you can see that now it's turned to orange, right? So in case you weren't familiar with the Razor to that extent, that's what Razor allow, allows you to do is to kind of have dynamic features in your templates without having to do string concatenation yourself, right? Okay, so I also wanted to show you another, another thing here, to just highlight some things in the differences between the version one and the version two of the, um, these two templates. This is version, let me move it here. This is version one, and that's version two. Let me actually do um, that. All right. By the way, just out of curiosity, do you program using the keyboard? Do you program using the mouse? Predominantly. Okay, I know most people have some sort of mixer, mixture, but do you program completely using the keyboard, mostly using the mouse? Right? But I've seen people who use the mouse a lot when they code. And like, do you know how to do this? What I just did. Again, watch, watch over there. What if I told you I want to collapse this, right? So that's back to one and that's back to two. This is my opinion, right? And I know this from, from experience and of course people who've been converts have vouched, vouched for it as well. Coding should be done purely with the keyboard. That's just what it should be. There's no reason to use the mouse when you're programming. We're not graphics artists, right? We're not doing a Photoshop thing or a Illustrator thing. We're coding. The Visual Studio team has spent a lot of effort in giving us an IDE that I'm sure the same goes for Visual Studio Code, an IDE that works completely with the keyboard. So it does mean you have to learn certain keyboard shortcuts, but once you do that, you can fly in this IDE, in, this IDE, in the debugger. It is super, super productive. One of the first things I do when I'm kind of working with a new team, you know, I start to, depending on whether if they're juniors or mids or whatever, I know some seniors are kind of fixed in their ways and, you know, you can't change it. But I'll work with the juniors and the mids to try and make them converse and they, they really realize the difference. So anyway. Side note there. Right. So the, for the most part, as I said, these two classes are the same. The difference is in the method, the public method here for the most part. So let's go to these two public methods here. I'm just going to move it to the top. Okay. So if you look at this method and the signature here, you'll see the, oh, this is version 2. So version 2 is on the left and version 1 is on the right. It's called just a model, right? Let's look at the version one. It's got all the different arguments here, as you can see. There's a lot of data here. What's also happened in version one is it's aware, this method is aware of the different templating or the naming conventions, if you will, for the embedded resources versus the Razor templates thing. Whereas here, you don't have that, right? Uh, the version two, in fact, other than go into the details, I think I'm, you know, kind of cut this short. Please examine the differences from a use case perspective, from a usage perspective, as well as from maintainability, uh, extensibility. I'm not concerned with extensibility. So just maintainability perspective and readability perspective. Examine the two, version one, version two, and please give me your feedback on which one you prefer and why. And it doesn't matter which one. I think both are good. But as I said, the preferences are based on the compromises you're not willing to make. That's all it is. If you prefer this design to that design, it has nothing to do with whether the design is truly good or not. It basically depends. Because there is no 
perfect design. Design, or the reasons we prefer one design over the other, is because there are certain compromises we don't want to make or are not willing to make. And if we are forced to do make a compromise in a certain thing that we don't like, we don't like the design. Now, of course, you have to be well informed. Right? You have to have a whole lot of experience, years and years of experience, but even actual you know, work experience to then understand which compromises are worth making or not, right? So maybe as a junior, you don't understand the difference. Maybe you don't even realize the compromises that are being made and whether this compromise is better than that and for what reason. But as you get more and more mature in your craft, then it, that decision is valuable. Till then it's not. So as a junior mid-level programmer or even on some seniors, if you have an opinion, maybe it's not a valid opinion. <laughs> Anyway, let me know. I'd be interested to hear from you why you prefer and which one you prefer. All right, so this brings us to the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I hope you learned something. If you have, please give me a thumbs up. And I will see you next time.